As Alberta's boomtown continues to rebuild from the fire, so too does its criminal network. They are a uh, self-identified outlaw motorcycle group, and outlaw motorcycle groups are involved in criminal activities. That's the nature of the, those uh, motorcycle groups. Two men were arrested last week by the Alberta law enforcement team, or ALERT, and Wood Buffalo RCMP in relation to a drug trafficking investigation. The men are believed to be members of uh, Hells Angel support clubs, known as tribal and syndicate. The arrests are evidence of what an author and expert in motorcycle gangs says is an increase in drugs and organized crime in the region. Toronto-based Yves Levine says it is up to politicians, health officials, and community members to report crimes and put an end to illegal drug trafficking in their community. RCMP are advising anyone with knowledge of criminal activity to report to a gang tip line. Stephen, how, how much of an impact does a gang tip line have? Well, or I potentially think it, have on Fort McMurray's illegal yeah, drug trade. I think in the long term, it's it's likely to have very little impact. I mean, I sympathize with the police. I mean, they have to make their best efforts to combat, you know, violent organized crime. There's no question about that. But, you know, this is a long-running saga in terms of the war on drugs, and it's it's a supply and demand issue. And if there's a significant demand for illegal drugs, there will be a supply. The profits are simply too great. It is too lucrative. Someone is going to end up supplying those drugs. And so you may be able to take down particular gangs or particular individuals, but at the end of the day, they're going to be to replaced. Fill that exactly. Spot, isn't there? Uh, Greg, is, is this the, t the type of criminal activity that's, that's necessarily visible to your average Fort McMurray resident? Right. I mean, you know, as Stephen said, and following up on that, is, is really at the end of the day, these visible gangs, and I call them visible gangs, street gangs at the lower level and outlaw motorcycle gangs somewhat uh, somewhat higher um, are really the tip of the iceberg in terms of the drug trade and, and they really operate largely as uh, distribution agents sometimes they'll they'll be on a mid-level in terms of transporting but really at the end of the day the the drug infrastructure is one that most people will not see and even if they do see it they it won't be recognizable I mean um, from the inception of uh, when the drug is produced in, in a foreign jurisdiction to when it's imported into Canada, for when it's transported from places of importation like Vancouver to you know Calgary or Edmonton, places of distribution, and then ultimately distributed. Uh, much of that is underwater and will never be seen by the general public. Will never be seen by someone calling in on a tip line. So, Marks, what what should the the community do then? Well, I, th I think there's there's two avenues. The first of all is that higher sophisticated criminal behavior uh, through motorcycle gangs and, and other gangs, uh, sophisticated gangs. And I think the only answer is a strong law enforcement um, approach. Um, I think when you're looking at the aspect of demand, um, so when you're looking at the users of the drugs and the activities involved in, in obtaining uh, money for drugs, that's usually involving lower end criminals, mostly you know starting off with young people and youth. And I think that's where the second pr approach needs, and you need strong crime prevention programs. You need a very healthy and robust education system. You need a very uh, in-tune medical system, and you need a very um, um, compassionate child welfare system, working collaboration with community and looking at sh best practices sort of in the area of crime prevention. And we need to target where the demand is and the, and the young people that are involved in, in sort of um, you know, buying product off, off, you know, off these sort of more sophisticated gangs. So the street level gangs and young people that are just sort of at risk of becoming involved in criminal activities or developing issues like mental health or addictions. That's where our dollars need to be focused. But for these motorcycle gangs and for these, these higher end uh, criminal gangs, it's just, it has to be law enforcement in my opinion. And, and a tip line I think is just, it's just wrapper, wrapping paper. It, it, it's not, it makes it look pretty, but it's, it does nothing. Okay, to our last topic for the panel. I, have you Googled yourself recently? If you have ever been arrested south of the border, you might want to. Some legal experts <coughs> are raising concerns over the practice of websites demanding money to remove mugshots. Websites like bustedmugshots.com and Bail Bond City remove personal information arrest records and mugshots from the web for a fee ranging anywhere from 20 to 400 
hundred dollars. The website's uh, disclaimers note that all mugshots and arrest records posted are already publicly available and they cannot guarantee accuracy or the most up-to-date status of convictions. Is this legal, Stephen? Well, it's, it's difficult to know for sure without looking at an individual case and how the law would apply in Canada. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily defamation if it's true that you were arrested. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to be easy to establish that this is some sort of extortion uh, or blackmail. Uh, again, if it's public information and they don't ask for the money ahead of time before the information is published. But it is, I think, in some cases at least, uh, pretty reprehensible conduct. Uh, and we have to be, I think, concerned about how this kind of information is, is released so it becomes available in the public domain, so it can be used for these kinds of nefarious purposes. And we do have some privacy legislation and some legal tools that may limit the availability of this. And I think that's really where we ought to be focusing our attention to ensure that, say, someone's mugshot after they've been arrested isn't widely circulated and available to the general public, because after all, that person may never actually be convicted of any offense. So, uh, Greg, what worries you about this trickling into our province? Sure, well, and I mean, again, segueing from what Stephen says there is, is, in fact, we're dealing with this issue right now um, in Alberta, uh, in which the, the Crown Prosecutor's Office in both Calgary and Edmonton have essentially digitized uh, disclosure. So, for um, a more layman's terms, arrest reports, mug shots, investigations have been put on electronic form. And so they're being provided to defense counsel in electronic form. And as we know about electronic documents, they're fairly easy tran you know, easily transferable. Um, they may be on a computer. If they're on a computer, they're likely on a, on a storage server of some sort. That could be on site. That could be off site. That could be in the United States or it could be in Jakarta. Um, it could be in a cloud somewhere. So the fact that we've gone to electronic documents, especially in the criminal defense or the criminal sphere, is concerning to me um, and segueing into, into something like this in which people may be taking advantage of uh, breaches in, uh, in terms of cybersecurity and utilizing uh, this information for the purpose of, of inappropriate gain like they're doing here with the mugshots. All right, gentlemen, I'll have to leave it there. Mark, we'll catch you first yeah. next time around.